All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Monica McCubrey and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist uh, with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission and um, here in the Lincoln office. And today is our second kind of uh, episode installment, I guess you want to call it, of our lunchtime virtual series called Snacks and Facts. Um, so uh, if you weren't aware, um, in Nebraska for October, it is Nebraska Reptile Month. So we got a proclamation from the governor. Um, it's very cool. We have a lot of cool events happening in October, um, really dedicated to the awareness of reptiles and to our native reptile species. So today what we're going to do is talk about um, some quick kind of facts about um, reptile defenses, so how they protect each other and how they protect themselves. So we will go ahead and get started because like I said, I know you guys have um, lunchtime things and I appreciate you joining me today for your lunch. Um, so let's go ahead and learn some facts while you guys eat some snacks. All right, here we go. I'm gonna share my screen here. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to be talking about reptile defenses, like I said. So um, I would love it if you have any questions and please go ahead and ask them in the chat. Um, just make sure that they're relevant and on topic to what we're talking about. And I'm sure that we won't have any issues. I never have. Um, also just letting everyone know that I am by no means an expert. I absolutely love reptiles and I think they're fascinating and I do a lot of research and I've done a lot of research over the past, you know, 30 some years and I've been alive. And so um, if there's a question that I absolutely cannot answer, I will find someone that can and then get back to you because I want to make sure that you have that understanding and that knowledge. So um, we will go ahead really quick and get started. I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with what reptiles are, um, but I just kind of always want to put this on every single one of them just to kind of give this in the back of your head and remember, you know, what are reptiles and when we talk about a reptile, what are we actually meaning when we say this? So, um, so one thing about reptiles is a lot of people group reptiles and amphibians together. So amphibians, things like frogs and salamanders and things like reptiles and crocodiles and lizards together. So that's not correct. Um, we have a lot of different um, species of animals and reptiles and amphibians are two totally separate species. They actually have not shared a common ancestor for about 300 million years. So that's a long time. Um, people are actually more related to frogs than reptiles and amphibians are related together. So kind of keep that in your head. Reptiles are totally different when we talk about um, those groups of animals. So the main thing that we see when we see a reptile is we look at their scale. So no matter what type of reptile it is, um, more than likely they're going to have scales. There are a couple of snakes um, that are scaleless. Um, and you might not think that a lot of animals or reptiles, they look like they have scales, but they do somewhere on their body. That's kind of what constitutes them as a reptile. Um, they're also dependent on external heat sources. So mammals, we make our own body heat. Snakes, reptiles, um, lizards, they cannot do that. They have to get it from somewhere else, like the sun or a hot rock or the concrete somewhere else. Most of them also lay shelled eggs. There are some in Nebraska, like our garter snakes, they give live birth. Most reptiles are going to lay, lay eggs um, or bear live young. They are vertebrates, so that means they have that backbone. They use their lungs to breathe. Um, and then most of our reptiles, not all, um, but most reptiles are gonna be carnivorous. So they will eat other animals. Something that we're gonna talk about today is, yes, they are predators for a lot of other animals, but they're also prey for bigger animals or other animals as well. So they, they fill both of those niches, a prey and a predator. And then in Nebraska, we have lizards, snakes, and turtles as far as the reptiles. There's a lot of other ones in the world. There's things like tortoises, crocodiles, and alligators. We obviously don't have those in Nebraska, but we have a lot of different types of reptiles nonetheless. All right, so what is a defense then? What do we mean when we talk about how they defend themselves? So like reptiles, they are carnivores. They eat other animals. So predators don't just sit around waiting for um, them to be eaten. They have to defend themselves. So they've developed a lot of different ways to protect themselves and to keep themselves safe. So when we talk about a defense, it might be venom, it might be poison, it could be camouflage. Um, one of them that I really like is trickery or sometimes the actual, you know, 
know, scientific word, we use mimicry, um, but they trick other animals. Some of them have claws, they have teeth, they have spikes on their body. So there's something that helps them protect themselves. They have some sort of adaptation that helps them to protect themselves. All right, so we're gonna go through the different major groups of reptiles that we have in Nebraska and kind of talk about what they do to protect themselves. And not all of the examples that I used we have in Nebraska, but I'm really gonna try and focus on things that we do have in Nebraska. So for instance, we're gonna talk about turtles to start. And I think the most obvious thing when you look at a turtle, you see their shell. That's kind of just their unique body feature that they've had for a very long time. Um, so throughout their evolution, throughout their adaptations, about 230 million years they've had to perfect that shell. Um, most of them have a very hard shell, but again, not all of them. There's always a, an exception in biology. Um, some of them have actually had um, a smaller shell or they have soft shells, um, but instead they might have another defense that works even better than a shell, like musking or a really foul smelling odor, hiding, or sometimes even they will burrow. All right, so when we look at their shell, um, most of the time their bony shell is covered with scales. So uh, people always ask me, where are the scales on a turtle? It's their shell, it's their neck, it's their leg. So <clears throat> they use this basically to defend themselves. Some turtles have the ability, like our box turtles that we have here in Nebraska, they can pull in all of their arms, their legs, their head, and shut their shell. It looks exactly like a box that protects them so other predators can't get inside. Um, so not all of them have that. If you've ever looked at a snapping turtle, for instance, they don't really have a bottom shell. We call that the plastron. They don't really have one, it's very small, um, but they do have the back part, that carapace part as well. All right, so when we talk about a shell, what is it? It is actually living tissue. So if all of us could take a second and look down at your fingernails, it's the same stuff for the most part. So your shell, or sorry, your fingernails are the same thing as a turtle shell. Same thing as a um, bird of prey, like an eagle, and you look at their talons, same type of material. It's a little different, but it's that same keratin material. And then their shells um, are actually covered with something called scoots, and they are kind of rearranged so that they um, kind of don't overlap the bones, but they um, are staggered so that they're very hard. So if an animal tries to bite them, or let's say they fall, um, or they get tipped over, something happens to them, they can still protect the inner part of their body. And we also have to remember that they can't take their shells off. A lot of people have told me sometimes that turtles can remove their shell and go find another one. That's not true. So they are born with their shell, they grow with their shell, and over time, if that shell is damaged, that could really hurt the turtle. Um, their backbone, their vertebrae, is fused to their shell. So if they get run over or if they get damaged, that can have severe consequences for the rest of their body. But again, not all turtles have a hard shell. We have soft shell turtles in Nebraska. We have spiny soft shells and smooth soft shells. Their scoots are then replaced by a really kind of a pliable leathery skin. If you've ever touched them, it's really cool. <clears throat> so when you look at a snapping turtle, the top part of their shell is called a carapace. And then the bottom part is called a plastron. So overall, their shell is made out of about 60 bones that are covered in those plates, that keratin plate. They're honestly, for the most part, um, things like mud turtles and then things like tortoises, which we don't have in Nebraska, but they're still out there. They're very, very rough. So if you ever touch them, they're like a tank. Uh, if you ever go to the zoo and see the tortoises, they're, they're like a moving tank. The shell can be soft, like our soft shell turtles. And then some of their shells are very reduced. So if we look at like the snapping turtle here, they have a top part, but then on the bottom, you just see a lot of skin. So they've actually had their shell over time um, smaller, so, but they have other things that help them defend themselves. And we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so main defense for any animal, and I don't blame them, um, is biting. So one of the things that a lot of 
turtles have the ability to do, actually few of them use it as a defense is just simply to bite. So things like our common snapping turtles, um, some of our soft shell turtles are actually pretty aggressive as far as biting. And then we don't have them in Nebraska, but alligator snapping turtles as well are the ones that are really known to bite as their first defense. So if you think about a snapping turtle, they don't have that really hard shell like a box turtle. It doesn't go all the right way around their body. Um, so instead, they have that biting defense instead. Um, and then many of those species have really long necks as well um, to increase their defensive capabilities. So a snapping turtle, for instance, can bite and it has a super long neck. If you ever look at a snapping turtle and watch its head um, extend out and their neck extend out, it is crazy how long it is. All right, so some turtles, um, a lot of the tortoises actually are really good burrowers as well. Um, some turtles, when you look at them, snapping turtles, a good kind of um, example is what we call counter shaded. So the basically the colors help them be protected on their shell from top predators and bottom predators. So when you look at a thing like a shark or a turtle or some fish even, um, when you look at them, the lighter color is usually on their belly and then the top part is usually a little bit darker. So if you're a predator and you look down, you see a dark shell and it kind of matches that dark water. Or if you're a predator and you look up, you see the white belly or the lighter colored belly kind of blends in with the sunlight reflecting off that water. So there's a reason for the colors that they are as well. Um, if you guys have ever heard of a gopher tortoise, we don't have them in Nebraska, but they're in places like Florida. They are awesome diggers. They dig really long tunnels and these guys are considered what we call a keystone species. So they um, dig these huge, huge burrows that sometimes can house as many as 360 different types of other animals. So without those gopher tortoises, those animals wouldn't have a home. Um, we have keystone species here in Nebraska. Um, things like a prairie dog does the same type of thing. They build lots of tunnels and things like salamanders and snakes and birds will use them as well. So um, hiding and burrowing is always a good defense as well if you can't bite or you don't have a huge shell. All right, and another thing that we have um, as well uh, as some turtle species, you might have heard of a musk turtle. So they release this really awful smell. Um, there's two little glands that are produced, um, produce this really terrible smell um, located on the carapace. So that's the top part of their shell. Um, usually this is turtles that are really tiny. So if you think about it, uh, no one's really going to mess with a tortoise, like they're ginormous, or a big snapping turtle, but a very, very small little turtle, um, like our box turtle, they're not very big either. Um, they don't have that musking smell, um, but very small, usually less than six inches. Um, this also, one thing that they will do is they will release the contents of their cloaca, so they like poop everywhere as well. So if you're a predator, you probably don't want to eat that because it's going to stink. Um, that's just one of their ways that they protect themselves. All right, so those were our turtles and how they kind of defend themselves. We're gonna move on to our lizard species. So in Nebraska, we have 10 different types of lizards. We don't have anything large like a Komodo dragon, but we have small little skinks and we have um, race runners and we have uh, sagebrush lizards, those kind of things. So they're, they're fairly small. So um, hissing, this is a defense. Um, it might not necessarily be super efficient, but a lot of predators will, it kind of warns them, hey, back off a little bit. Um, so it's a common method for lizards. One of the things that they will do is hiss, kind of like a cat, if you ever heard a cat hiss. Um, oftentimes this is combined with something else. So um, they will hiss, or like if you've ever seen a frilled dragon, I always think of like Jurassic Park when they talk about the Dilophosaurus and it like spits and it hisses and it frills its, its face out, kind of like that. So there are no Dilophosaurus around anymore, unfortunately, but um, lizards do the same thing. They frill, they hiss, they could bite. There's lots of different things that they could do. Even being such a small animal, they have a lot of defense tactics. All right, so this is actually a skink. Um, these guys get pretty large in Nebraska, <clears throat> um, almost up to a foot long sometimes. If you've ever found a 
a skank, these guys get very large. Um, sometimes what they will do is they will puff themselves out. Uh, toads actually are really known for doing this as well. So they blow air into their body and kind of puff their chest out. This makes them look bigger. So if an animal tries to eat them, they may be a little intimidated by their size. Um, some lizards will only puff out their throats, but there are others that can inflate their entire body to make them even look bigger. Um, there is something called a horn toed lizard. Um, it has these spikes on it and it kind of inflates its body like a balloon. And so overall, it looks like this big spiky balloon if something would try to eat him. All right, lizards are also known for their breakaway tails. So some lizards, um, not all can do this, but it is better to lose your tail than to lose your life. Um, things like the leopard gecko, a lot of anole lizards, which is um, what I have pictured here. These guys are found like everywhere in Florida and in the tropical areas. Um, so if a predator grabs a hold of their tail, they actually have the ability to release part of their tail. So the predator will eat the tail and and then that lizard can scurry away. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is how they protect themselves. They'd rather get their tail eaten than their whole body. And then depending on the species, they can actually grow their tail back. Um, it will never look the same. It will never be as long. But again, it's better than losing your life. All right, and then when you look at these really large lizards like Komodo dragons, iguanas, monitor lizards, like the goannas that you hear about, um, these guys have really thick, powerful, muscular tails. So in this photo, you can see they have this huge tail. They can actually whip it around, which doesn't sound like a lot, um, but there are some really large lizards that will break the skin of some animals and it hurts. If you ever get tail whipped by a really large monitor lizard, it hurts. Like it leaves welts on your body. So if you think about a smaller animal, um, like a jackal or a fox or something that would try to eat them, that would do some serious damage. So thinking about this lizard, um, it doesn't look like it runs very fast, but it does have claws. It has teeth. It can whip its tail. Um, it's honestly a little faster than you think it is. These guys can get up on their hind legs um, oftentimes and run, and as well as they can push their body up and run as well. We're not talking like cheetah speed here, but um, overall they can, they can make a good run for it. <coughs> All right. This is a species that we have in Nebraska. Um, this is called a mountain shorthorned lizard. These guys are found out in Western Nebraska, um, but a lot of them will have spikes on their body um, or spines. So they look scary. This guy is not very big at all. Um, they usually only get like three to four inches long. And so they're not very big, which doesn't seem scary. Um, but if an animal tries to eat them, um, it's really painful if they bite and they get one of those spines in their mouth. Um, so usually if predators try to bite or do this, they, they learn very quickly not to do it again. Um, so like I talked about the mountain shorthorn lizard that we have in Nebraska, they have a lot of spikes on their body, their tail, their head um, is even, it looks like a dragon. Um, and then they have these spines kind of located around their belly. Any soft body or tissue area, they're gonna have a lot of those spines on them. And again, they have lots of other defenses as well. All right. We're moving along here because again it's just a short little program this afternoon or this um, lunch hour so we're going to go ahead and talk about snakes uh there's a lot of different things when we talk about snakes um so basically as the snake gets larger the amount of defenses that they have kind of goes down. So if you think about it, no one's really going to mess with an anaconda. No one's really going to mess with a very large bull snake. Um, so the larger that they are, they don't have as many defenses, but the smaller that they are, they have way more different types and different abilities to defend themselves. So snakes, most thing that they're going to do, they're going to try and get away. No matter what snake it is, usually they don't hang around to see what you're doing. They like escape as much as they can. They could bite, they could poop on you, they could hiss, they could tail rattle, they are sometimes venomous. They camouflage, they can strike at you, they can open mouth um, hiss at you. There's a lot of different things that snakes can do. So this is one of our snakes that we have in Nebraska. This is a bull snake. They always look very menacing. They have um, a very loud hiss that they make that we'll talk about later. Um, they're not venomous or anything like that, but they do get fairly large in Nebraska. All right, 
First thing that animals, no matter what type of animal it is, usually they're going to try to escape. If you've ever tried to come up on an animal to get a photo of it, or if you are dumb enough and want to touch it, um, most things that they're going to do is they're going to run. They're going to slither. They're going to fly away. They don't want to stick around um, to see what you're going to do or what you're going to do to them. Even if you just want to take their photo, they're just going to run away. So for most snakes, uh, snakes, this is the first thing that they want to do. Um, their size and their shape um, helps them escape through super narrow openings. Um, so a lot of us that see garter snakes in the spring or in the summer, they go in through those small openings and like retaining walls or in your houses. This is very easy for them just to scurry in there. They can also go into the water. Um, a lot of snakes does not have to be a water snake. All snakes can swim. Um, all snakes don't choose to swim, but they can, if, especially if an animal is chasing them or if they're trying to escape from a predator. They can also climb trees or fence posts. Um, and then one of the things that they do, if they cannot escape, then it is time for them to do something else. One of the things they can do is a hood. So one thing I'm sure you all right away thought about was a cobra. Um, that's like the quintessential hooding animal that we have in the world. Um, but we actually do have a couple of them in Nebraska that will do pretty much the same thing. They don't have the size like a cobra, but they do flare out their hoods. Um, so basically what's happening is that they are um, flattening their body and basically they spread their ribs as far as they can. And that pulls the scales really tight. And then they look larger than they actually are. Um, this photo here is a very um, unusual looking um, Eastern hognose. There's, this is all black. Usually they never look like this, but the photo is really cool. So if you look at their face and their neck, it looks really flat like a pancake. That's exactly what they want. They want to look larger. They want to look scary. Um, so in Nebraska, we have the Eastern hognose and the Western hognose. So the Eastern hognose is sometimes called, um, I think people have called it like the Plains Cobra or something like that. There's a funny nickname um, about them because we've even had people here at Game and Parks like message us and say, I have a cobra in my backyard. It's clearly not a cobra. It's one of these guys. Um, they flare their hoods out. They don't have as much loose skin as a cobra does, um, but they still do the same thing. They look larger and they're scarier to another predator. All right, we do have some species in Nebraska that are venomous. So um, within Nebraska, we have about 29 different types of snakes. And of those 29, um, only four of them are venomous. Um, so we do have venomous species of snakes in Nebraska. This is their last resort. Um, venom is very effective, but it's also very um, energetically like expensive for the animal to make. Um, so this is one of their last things that they want to do. So if getting away doesn't help, um, if they tail rattle, maybe they'll like strike at you, they'll coil up. Those are all their last like, hey, just letting you know, stay away from me. And then if all that still doesn't work and they can't get away, then they can bite. So um, where does venom come from? It actually was started as a digestive aid. So it was not originally a form of defense. It was helping to aid them in digestion. And then over time, it evolved into a um, defense tactic. So venom um, is usually in their glands and their salivary glands, and it travels through a bunch of like little ducts and little um, vents basically in their mouth to their bone and they have hollow fangs. So depending on what type of snake it is, they could have rear fangs, they could have the big ones that fold out. There's lots of different types depending on the species, but they act like a hypodermic needle. So when they bite, they release and push that venom into their food. All right, so here's a photo of the four venomous snakes that we have in Nebraska. Um, we have copperheads, which are found in very extreme Southeast Nebraska. Um, timber rattlesnakes, same, very Southeast Nebraska oriented. Um, Massasaugas, again, Southeast Nebraska here. Um, and then prairie rattlesnakes are a little bit more common. They're found out in Western Nebraska. Um, but as you can see, they all have to kind of have the same banding, the same blotchiness about them. Um, some people say that you can tell a venomous snake by the shape of their eyes or the shape of their head. 
not always true. Some snakes have a very triangular shaped head and they're not venomous. Some have a normal looking head and they are venomous. So um, I would never go off of that. If the best thing is, if you don't know what it is, just leave it alone. Honestly, just leave anything alone. <clears throat> All right, so there's different types of toxins or venom when we talk about this. There's things like a cytotoxin, um, which causes damage to the cell structure and the function. So each of these different types of toxins, they do different things to the body. Um, hematoxins, basically it disrupts your hemostasis. So um, this is all of your different things going on inside your body. Um, neurotoxins affect your nerves. Cardiotoxins disrupts the heart functions. Um, with these animals though, it's never a good idea to say, this is strictly a neurotoxic animal. It's often wrong. And um, when we talk about venom and we talk about toxins, it's usually a bunch of different things mixed together to create this big cocktail, um, basically. And um, when you're trying to talk to someone or, or say, I was bit by this snake, um, you have to remember that that antivenom is very specified for a type of animal, a type of snake. So um, don't underestimate the type of toxin um, in some of these animals. All right, so besides venom and besides hissing and hooding, um, tail rattling is a good kind of an indicator of um, an animal saying, leave me alone, I don't like this, I'm scared. Um, so snakes, all snakes actually can rattle their tails. They do it a little bit differently. Um, I'm sure all of us have heard of a rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes are like the common group of snakes that will vibrate or rattle their tail. Um, but actually in Nebraska, we have another one called the Western Fox Snake. Um, they also can rattle their tail, but they don't have the actual rattle on the end of their tail. So when rattlesnakes do this, they hold their tail vertically and they will basically wave it back and forth. If you ever get a chance to go to like a YouTube video and watch in slow motion how they rattle their tail, it's kind of neat. But things like a fox snake, um, they will rattle their tail horizontally. So two different types of tail rattling, but they both produce the same outcome. It's kind of a, hey, leave me alone. Um, so the thing about the fox snakes is they won't actually produce a sound unless they rattle it against something. So for instance, we have a fox snake in our office and every time he gets a little threatened or excited or someone comes up to the glass, he might rattle his tail against the newspaper or a rock. And it sounds very much like a rattlesnake. Um, but out in the wild, it could be a bunch of dry leaves or some bark or a tree. And if you're not familiar with what that sounds like versus a rattlesnake or a fox snake, your first instinct is, okay, there's a rattlesnake, I should probably get out of here. So that's exactly what he wants you to do is just leave him alone. All right, hissing is another good thing. Bull snakes in Nebraska are an awesome example of this. Um, so first thing a, a snake's gonna do, is gonna try to escape. If it can't escape, it will sometimes vibrate its tail. Um, these guys will kind of make this scary looking coiling look. Um, so like this photo that I have here um, and they will vibrate its tail. They will open it up and hiss really loudly. Um, so they can be heard up to about a hundred feet away um, just making this hissing noise. So they'll kind of slightly open their mouth and then they have a very developed, what we call an epiglottis um, that enhances the sound. So what they do is they force air out of their mouth and it will um, rattle across their, basically their tongue or their epiglottis. And it makes that noise that we kind of um, stereotype with snakes. All right, another thing that snakes will do is they also will musk. So things like our uh, musk turtles that we talked about earlier, very similar, um, snakes will do it too. They release this terrible, terrible smell. Some people say it smells like rotten eggs. Some people says it smells similar to a skunk. Um, whatever it is, it, it's gross, it stinks. Um, a lot of the times they will do this so they can ward off a predator without fighting or biting or using their venom. Um, remember venom is expensive and it's hard to fight. It, it's exhausting after a while. Um, so they wanna produce as much outcome with very little energy. So this is really more common for smaller snakes and younger snakes. Um, not all snakes will do this, but things, especially in Nebraska, like garter snakes, water snakes, ring neck snakes, they are really known to do this. So for instance, um, when you ever have picked up a garter snake, usually the first thing they do is they musk. 
It's a fancy word for their releasing their cloacal contents and they poop on you. First thing you're probably going to do is gross. This is disgusting. You drop the snake. That's exactly what he wants. He wants to get away. Um, so it smells. It's really unlike um, palatable to a predator. They don't want to eat that or smell it. Um, so that's kind of their one of their defense mechanisms. All right, and then one of my favorite things is we hear about this a lot with possums. Um, they play dead. So possums, it's, a, it's an involuntary response. They get so scared and it's basically a catatonic state. They can't help it. Um, these guys can. So one of our most like drama queens of the entire snake world are our uh, hog noses. So especially our Eastern hog noses. Um, so most hunters, when they look for an animal, they want something alive. They want to kill it and they want to eat it. Um, they usually leave dead things for scavenging species, um, like for instance, a turkey vulture. Um, <clears throat> so basically what these snakes will do, if they get scared, they will turn themselves over in this photo here. The snake is very much alive, um, but it is just pretending to play dead. So they look dead, they open their mouth, they stick their tongue out. Um, if that still doesn't work, they will poop and they will also like throw up as well. So if you think about it, if you're a predator and you go to eat this live snake and then all of a sudden it throws up and poops everywhere, it probably is not going to smell very good. It's going to look gross and you don't want to eat that. You're probably as a predator going to go find something else. Um, so they will, uh, one thing that's kind of neat is if a snake does this and you roll him back over, he'll immediately flip back on his back to um, pretend he's dead again. So he's a really big drama queen, but it's very effective so that he doesn't get eaten. And then when the snake feels like he's safe, he will flip back over and kind of slither away. That's it. Yeah. So that was it. So it's just kind of a little taste of some of the different types of animals that we have here in Nebraska, as far as our reptiles and what they do to defend themselves. Um, if you guys are really interested and you want to learn more, these will be up on our education YouTube channel. Um, we have the one from last week up there. We talked about reptile teeth and how they eat. Um, we also have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. We have a wildlife education website as well. And then um, we're actually not going to have a Snacks and Facts next Tuesday. Um, there's a big conference going on. Um, so we decided to cancel that one so that the conference can go. But then at the very end of October, we're going to talk a little bit about our reptile conservation. So what are we doing, especially in Nebraska, to protect our reptile species and even some of those reptile species within the world? So with that... Are there any comments or questions or anything um, that you guys were curious about? I will stop sharing my screen here. And go back to Zoom. All right, maybe one comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining me. I, what, I didn't try to make it very long because I know we're on lunch and you don't need me to listen to me for an hour, so. All right. Well, if anyone has any other questions, I will be here a couple more minutes. Um, otherwise, please join us again on October 26th when we talk about some reptile conservation in Nebraska and have a great reptile month. There's a lot of cool events going on. So be sure to check out our Nebraska Game and Parks outdoor calendar to find those events. Yes. Thank you, everyone. All right.